Welcome back to Where Are They Now podcast. My guest today was a contestant on season 18 of Big Break, Greenbrier, I believe. Uh, it featured 12 men and premiered on October 2nd, 2012. This guy's got a ton of talent, a tremendous demeanor, one I'm jealous of, I have to tell you on the course, but also has a very, very competitive side. Uh, his trademark, in my view, was his consistency, but uh, only that when he lost that consistency, how he scrambled was uh, really, really amazing under that kind of pressure. So I am uh, excited to speak with Mark Silvers today. Mark, welcome to Where Are They Now podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So let's jump right into our listeners' questions. We call this our quick hitter segment, and uh, we're going to run through five or six questions. Um, first question right off the top, how much did the camera distract you on and off the course, and did they do a lot of reshooting? Uh, you know, honestly, on the golf course was not a big deal. Um, I mean, you, you kind of had to let the cameras get in their places, um, you know, so it wasn't, it looks like it's very fluid on TV, but it's not because, you know, you hit a shot and then they've got to move the cameras and so on and so forth. Um, but once you got into the shot, especially, especially the challenges that involved, you know, playing a hole or hitting certain golf shots, it wasn't a big deal. Um, you know, the, the shots that, that, you know, the, the glass breaking and the flop wall and, and things like that, you know, you're more focused on that than you are the cameras. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess it was, it was tougher for me, um, off the golf course, just because it's not something I'm used to, you know, on the golf course, I can kind of go into my little bubble and, and try to focus and do my thing, but off the golf course, um, you know, having cameras on you and knowing they're on you all the time and uh, knowing any, you know, stupid little thing you say could end up uh, in front of a bunch of viewers. That, that's, uh, that's, more, uh, that's more uncomfortable than, you know, hitting a duck hook out there on the golf course. Excellent. Uh, next question is uh, long days followed by post-golf interviews. Give us a typical day in the life of a big breaker. It, it is sun up to sundown. I mean, I remember the, I want to say the wake ups were around 5 a.m., um, you know, because you had to, we were in a couple of different houses, but there was only cameras in one house. Um, so you had to get up, get dressed. You know, the breakfast was typically around 6.30. Uh, you had to get a mic on, you know, you had to make sure you were presentable. And then uh, they had to film us eating breakfast every morning. So that not only did we actually have to eat breakfast, but you had to do, um, you know, what you needed to do for the show, which, which always took a little bit. Um, you know, so by the time you got down to the little bit that they let you warm up, um, you know, it was, it was already eight o'clock. Um, so they, they were long days and, you know, depending on whether you had to go all the way to the, um, elimination or not, um, you know, it, it could be a short day or it could be a really long day, but I mean, you know, especially early on where they had to do the post round interviews for, um, you know, up to 12 guys. I mean, the, the last one might not be done until close to 10 o'clock. Um, Jeez. they had, they had, luckily they had, you know, people that would come up and bring us dinner. So you, you could just kind of go from, you know, the, the breakfast to the golf, to the shower, to the wardrobe change. Then they had to, you know, make you put on a little bit of makeup and, and then you had to be shuttled down to the houses where the producers were and try to eat some dinner, you know? So if you were one of the last ones to get interviewed, uh, post golf, it was, you know, it was 5 AM to 10 PM. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. That is long days. I had some questions that really got into the minutia to, to your point there with breakfast and all being together. They were asking who decides to, who was, who decides to read the card? It never was fought for and stuff like that. I also had a question about, I noticed on big break that when members hit off the tee, they walk back and the other person doesn't walk to the tee box until the person gets back. What is that because of filming? And I went back and looked at it and this young lady that asked this question was exactly right. You guys would stand there and say it's a challenge and you and right. you know, Brian are going and Cooper going head to head. You tee off, tee off and he wouldn't you know, you know, pass most of the time. He would stand there and have kind of like a shot 
of you two guys together. It was interesting. Um, yeah. I don't like the answer to that. I don't know what there is to answer, but we saw it happening on there. No, it's, it's true. Yeah, no, you had to stay in place until, um, you know, until it was your turn to go. And sometimes there was a fairly large gap. Um, you know, and not only that, there was, before you did every challenge, there was, um, I mean, you had to sign a waiver saying that, you know, there had to be an attorney on site letting, you know, to make you sign a piece of paper stating that you understood what the challenge was. So yeah, there, there's a lot that goes into every shot that's, uh, that's not seen. That's for sure. There's very little rhythm you can get in. You're signing documents. You have cameras in your face. It's not like your tea to green in your own world with you and a caddy. It is, you know, one shot over a wall and then go sit down and, you know, an hour later hit another one. Maybe that's, that's mm -hmm. really amazing to me. It's really amazing. Yeah. You mentioned the contracts signing prior to each uh, challenge. Uh, one of the next questions is right around there. It's about the secrecy of the whole event. And the question reads, mm -hmm. uh, were you sworn to secrecy? and not allowed to talk about the show once you found out you were selected and then post a uh, big break until the premiere. Yes. Um, you had to fill out a lot of paperwork. Uh, you were not supposed to tell anybody that you got selected where you were going. Um, I mean, they didn't even tell you where you were going. They, they asked where you wanted to fly out of and they booked us flights to, Roanoke, Virginia, I believe. So, I mean, we le legitimately did not even know where we were going to be. Um, you know, while you're there, they let you use uh, one of, you can't have a cell phone. They let you use a cell phone uh, to call your family uh, for, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes a day and somebody had to listen. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I want to say the contract was that, you know, if you divulge the results before uh, the series aired, they, you were liable for up to maybe even a million dollars that they could come back and sue you for. Wow. Yeah. They, they did not want, uh, they did not want any details of the show leaking out. That's for sure. Two of the probably most popular questions we had from the big break fans. Um, the first one was where did the eliminated, uh, teammates go were they able to play golf could they go and have a beer what what did they do during the day and evening were they sequestered uh well uh luckily i didn't really have to find out um <laughs> you did not they the no, only one. so we were yeah so we were um we were up in a couple of houses up in this um very kind of exclusive neighborhood out on the greenbrier property but out away from the hotel um you know they they tried to keep us as big of a secret as possible. So when you got eliminated, I believe the eliminated contestants did end up, they, they got a room. Uh, they were allowed to play a little golf. I actually think there was a little competition um, in ours to get back on an episode to compete for some cash. Um, but yeah, I think they were able to play golf and do a couple of things. Um, obviously you had a chaperone, wherever you went, whether you were still in the show or eliminated. So, um, yeah, everything was very hush hush. The other question was, we saw you guys on the practice range a lot. Was there a putting green? Was there, you know, other things? And, and segue to that is, did you, were you allowed to practice before a challenge? Yes. So, question? so, uh, the back of the range was ours. There was a little short game area, putting green, um, and the back side of the driving range, which is where we practice exclusively. And they wouldn't tell you exactly what the challenge was, but they would hint at it. You know, if it was a driving contest, they say, you, you know, you might want to hit some drivers or, you know, the first day I'm pretty sure they said you might want to work on punch shots, which it ended up being the glass break, or you might want to work on some high short, you know, they wouldn't tell you what it was, but they would, give you a general sense of, okay, you, you got 30 minutes to warm up. You may want to focus on this. Got it. Uh, two final quick hitters. These are directly, directly to you. Uh, first one is Mark, did you get close to anyone while you were on the show and are you still connected with them today? Yeah. Um, so Rick Cochran and I were buddies beforehand. We were both playing on the Hooters tour at the time. Um, we had known each other for a few years, played a lot of golf together. So that was neat. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, uh, I've kept in touch with a lot of guys. Um, 
shoot, I had dinner in Canada with James Lepp uh, last summer. Um, you know, I still talk to Ray a little bit. I still talk to Brian a little bit. Um, you know, Isaac had was on the East Coast a couple of years afterwards and came by the house. So I would say the majority of the guys um, – still have some form of, of contact with for sure. We had, uh, we had, we really did. We had a great group of guys. So, so that was, uh, that was easy to do. Awesome segue to our next question. It says, Mark, you were one of a good, a great group of players, but more importantly, a group of good guys. Um, did you feel the same way? For sure. Yeah. I mean, when I was looking around, obviously Rick was having a great year that year. Um, I knew Derek Bolin, um, I I did not know James, but I knew of James. He was a little bit older than I was, but, um, you know, he had one of the best college careers of anybody around at any time around me in college. Um, And, uh, you know, you had a couple of guys that played in some majors. And, I mean, when we went down the list, I was like, wow, these guys are – this is a a pretty strong group of golfers we got here. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Uh, quick programming note. If you have any questions for your favorite big break star, um, send them to our Twitter, or Instagram at where are they now podcast or email us at where are they are, where are they now podcast at gmail.com. And I'll go get those answers for you in our quick hitter segment. Uh, in the coming weeks, just so you know, we have many, many more big breakers, Tof Peterson, Cindy Miller, uh, Mark Murphy, and Don Donatello uh, all are going to be joining the show. So, Look out for those uh, folks coming on board. Right now, we are speaking to Mark Silvers, the champion of Big Break Greenbrier, and uh, we're going to talk about the the greatest comeback uh, that I've seen on Big Break. And I was a I was a fan when it was live, and I'm still um, taping the shows and and watching those at night. My wife w- walked in the other day, and she said, "How are you watching golf at midnight?" But anyway, uh, that's my own problem. Uh, Love so, that. <laughs> Uh, one after the other. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Um, I wanted to talk about the the origin of this whole thing. So the idea of Big Break, were you a fan? Did you know about it? What was the motivation to, to try out? And then tell us a little bit about the tryout. Sure. Um, you know, I knew about it. Um, there was actually a guy from Savannah on, I think it was the first season. Um, and I didn't even know who it was. A uh, bigger guy. Um, played some golf at a golf course that I didn't know, but, you know, early on it was, um, you know, it was, I feel like now granted there were some good players, double D was a great player. You know, Kip Enley is a good player. Justin Peters, who won the first one is a great yeah. player. Mm-hmm. Um, was it but, big you know, Mike Foster was, by the way? What's that? Yeah. It was Mike Foster. Yeah. Okay. It was Mike Foster. Um, but it was. I couldn't tell if it was more about golf or more about, you know, the, the drama and, and things like that. And, and I mean, but it was, it was such a cool spin on golf and reality and, and mixing the two. Um, so I watched a little bit of it. I wouldn't say I watched it religiously. And then, I don't know. Um, you know, when, when Tommy won, um, you know, obviously I went to school in South Carolina I knew who two gloves was and I was like, man, this is, um, this is cool. I mean, there are some, there are some guys winning, you know, and then Tommy went off to win on the, I guess it was the nationwide tour at the time and, and go on to get his PGA tour card. And then you had Matt Every and, you know, nitties and the females and, and it be, started to become like, okay, like they're doing a good job with both of these things. Now they've, they've got some, some quality golf, to go along with the, the great, the, the cool side stories and, and some of the wacky uh, challenges. And, and it, as a golfer, uh, a pro golfer, that started to appeal to me more was, okay, now they're, you know, they're given some exemptions. They're playing for some real money. They're playing some real golf here at the end. Um, and that was kind of what intrigued me, uh, which leads me into, 2012, um, which was kind of a, kind of a weird year for me. I, I had a a really good year and was playing on the Hooters tour and had played well. And, and my dad got sick and, and the guy who was my agent, uh, um, actually knew the guys who started the show and he was Tommy's agent and 
Charlie Reimer's agent and he was like, Hey, you know, you know, you get, you got a great thing going. Would you ever be interested in play and, you know, going on the big break? It, you know, it was really a game changer for Tommy. And I kind of, br- I didn't, I wouldn't say I brushed it off. I actually think he, he called me about it the year before and I went and tried out and, uh, and didn't, didn't get in. And he said, man, I think you should try again. Like a, you had a hell of a year last year and, and, um, you know, you got a good story working and, you know, it can't hurt. And I said, and, and they happened to be doing an interview at a Hooters store event that I was playing in. I believe it was in Ocala, Florida. Um, they, they, at the time they were, they, they were traveling around to some, some mini tour events and, and setting up and you could sign up for, for an interview. And, and I did that and it felt like it went really well. And, Got a call that I was a, a semifinalist a couple of weeks later, and and they were narrowing it down. And a few weeks after that, got the call that that I was on the show. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Any special preparation? I mean, I, I you didn't build a wall in the backyard. We talked about that. Yeah. You didn't take out any of the glass in the house. Um, but how did you prepare for it? Well, uh, I mean, I was just playing, and, and honestly. They they give you they 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 keep you so distant from the whole process. It's hard to prepare. I mean, obviously we we've, we've seen it. We know the flop wall and the glass break. But I was playing a ton of golf. Like it was, you know, we shot it in summertime. You know, which is I was playing every week. And ironically, it almost got me in some legal trouble because uh, I had um, I had been summoned for jury duty. Uh, during a Hooters tour event and I got it postponed to a week where they had an off week and you, you know, you can only do that once. Right. Well, then I get the call that I'm on the big break and it's during the time that I postponed <laughs> my jury duty. Uh, so I oh. called the juror's office and I said, I, this is going to be, I don't think this is going to be met very well, but I need to defer one more time. And they say, you can't do that. We can hold you in contempt oh. and we can, you know, so I had to actually have an attorney go down to the courthouse for me to say, listen, like, I promise he's not making this up. There's something really important that came up that he, he needs one more deferral. And they basically said, if he does not show up, we will come and take him to jail. So, uh, so yeah, it, there was, it, it, you know, and there's not a whole lot of time between when you find out that you're on the show when you got to get going. So. You know, I was still trying to play. I already had a schedule played out. And uh, so it was kind of uh, not much time to prepare anyway. But nothing, honestly, nothing could, nothing you could do would prepare you for what that show is like. Yeah. And that's what I want to segue to right now is the psychological effect of that show. Every single person I've talked to, Mark, talks about the pressure. You have, you know, you've played in U.S. Opens. You've played in PGA events. And it's like I said before, it's tee to green and it's you and your caddy here. You're on TV and they're focused just on you and making some crazy shot. And then even when you get out and play golf, um, you know, it's, it's um, segmented, you know, you're playing three holes here, two holes here. Maybe you're playing a, a wedge game with three locations or you're trying to get it inside a ring or closest to a line in the middle. Um, the pressure, talk about the pressure there. Yeah. I mean, and it's, and it's totally, totally different. I mean, it's every shot that you hit in that show felt like the first shot of a big term, a PGA tour event, because, you know, you didn't have a chance to warm up. There were these huge weights, you know, there's between shots, there's cameras. I mean, you, you know, that every shot, it's like you get a chance to, feel what Tiger Woods feels for a minute because every shot you hit is televised. You know, you're not going to get away, uh, you know, with, with shooting 78 and never making it on TV. You know, you hit a, you, you hit a great shot or you duff a chip, you know, it's going to be uh, front and center. And, um, you know, we're, we're taught in golf to handle pressure you know, you get into a routine and, and, and when you can't do that anymore, it's, it's, it's tough. It really is. I mean, I, I remember, and I'm guilty of it as well. You watch, uh, you know, seasons before that, before I was on it and I'm like, you know, at least how do you hit that shot? Well, it's like, you don't take into account the guy was probably sitting on a bench for 45 minutes before he had to pop up and, you know, try to hit a three iron. 
um, and, and then hit one shot and then go sit back down. That's uh, it's totally different from anything you experience playing playing tournament golf. Charlie Harrison said to me yesterday, first question he got when he was in the airport, a couple and their son, 10 years old or 12 years old, came over to them and said, how did you three putt from 15 feet in the, your elimination uh, event? And he said, one of the things that TV didn't show is we did that whole five times. We pushed yeah. with pars or birdies five right. times. And by the time, and it, then by the time they were done, it was windy and raining. And he said, I, I, I just had it. I was, you know, I was exhausted right. from the day. And yep. I gasped. I hit that putt nine feet by and I had to make it and otherwise it's three putts. So yeah, you can, and we don't see that, right? We don't, the right. viewer does not see that and all the different things going on before we get to the competition and talk about all the challenges and your journey to the championship. What was the bis- biggest misconception about big break? Do you think? Oh, biggest misconception. Um, I mean, honestly, I think it's just the fluidity of the whole thing. I mean, it, it, the, and, and the editors of the show are so good um, at making everything look so seamless. And it's not. I mean, you watch 48 minutes, you see a lot of golf, and it takes nine hours to get that 48 minutes. I mean, and, and you know, a lot of that's interviews. So, you know, you're watching 30 minutes of golf, it takes nine hours. You know, it's, um, it's just... I would say that, you know, how does that guy hit that shot? Well, it's like, you know, you have no idea how long or what the situation was like or how many times, you know, somebody had to play a hole or, or what the situation was. And I, and I would say that, and, and it's, it's a, they're fair questions, but, and it's impossible for people to know um, exactly how, how it works behind the scenes. Jeez. Amazing stuff. Uh, I am excited to welcome Mark Silvers from the Big Break Greenbrier, the champion of Green, uh, Big Break Greenbrier, to the show. Uh, and now we're going to get into the events and the challenges and all the good stuff. Uh, and then we'll figure out what he's doing today and hear from Mark about what is life like uh, post uh, Big Break. So in doing my research and my crack staff here of two people, um, we started going through the challenges. And the first one that came up, um, first of all, I have to tell you a quick coming about Rick because I don't have mm-hmm. a question about it when you guys were playing the tic-tac-toe and he <laughs> made that error the best uh line you've ever made he said oh man I, I didn't realize that and you put your head down and you said I didn't know what the beep you were doing <laughs> it's the funniest. You, you just kind of were trying to you could see your head turning like how yeah. do I say this to him but you're like I was wondering what the beep you were doing um and by the way, to Rick's credit, he still won that. I believe he won that uh, tic tac toe that time right there. He didn't win the whole thing. I think James did, but he, yeah. Yeah. he came back and got it straight anyway. Um, mm-hmm. So, and the other one, the other comment, uh, you guys, and in, in talking about the group, we had a bunch of questions on, and we've reached out to to Chan, and as I mentioned, Brian is going to be on the show. Mm-hmm. Brian kind of loses it a little bit. You have Chan eating grass, you yeah. know, but he could play too. He stuck that par three oh, yeah. to you know four feet for that birdie on that team event with brian and yourself uh brian another one in the in those bunker shots you know it was like he was born in the bunker it's it was just really impressive you know you smashed his driver on the bench and stuff it was a unique group uh, but one of the yeah. other funny comments mark was when anthony um you know all you guys are going in and you're not able to see breaking glass and whether you're 20 or whatever and he hit it and he started yelling and he was like in sixth place out of that. Give us your philosophy. Let's jump right in. You went after the zero at the glass breaking, just wanted to get it right done right away quick and get out. Yeah. So, I mean, that's another one. I was, I was kind of in the bottom half and that was our first, um, that was our first challenge of the entire show. And so they, they let you warm up, but then they seclude you uh on the other side of a big group of trees on another hole so you can't see anything and you just have to sit there and you get a heads up when you're like five minutes out and they let you hit two or three punch shots just into the trees and i was such a nervous wreck that i was just like i just want to make contact with it what's the easiest thing to hit um 
my brain was going such a million miles an hour, you know, in hindsight, I was like, well, that was pretty stupid, but I was so worried about being that guy that could not hit the glass that I, I just, I had no idea. And truthfully, that was the best thing that happened to me because when I saw the results, I was like, you cannot play this show trying to play conservative. Like I would rather go down swinging, trying to play aggressively than, than try to do something, you know, overthink a challenge or something like that. And it actually turned out to be a, a great thing that happened. It certainly did. You went on a tear of, you know, immunities and, I believe you didn't face elimination challenge at all until it got to the three final three, which is, you know, unheard of uh, with just the talent level and these events that are challenges that are, you know, like we talked about a bunch of times, it's not something you do every day. So that was an amazing journey that you went on. I want to ask you two things. We got to get to the flop ball, but I want to ask you about two really interesting things that happened at Greenbrier. The first being the opportunity to go to that underground bunker. Give me your thoughts. I know you were part of that group. Um, mm-hmm. I've actually played in Greenbrier uh, at the um, – oh, boy, I forgot the course now. It begins with an M. Um, anyway, um, I never had the opportunity to go down there. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, no, it was, it was really cool. And it's crazy, I, I mean, to think that that was happening under everybody's noses, that nobody knew anything about it, and, and the threat that they perceived could be possible um, and just – how hiding, you know, the government and, or really any entity that can just hide things in plain sight is just incredible. And it just makes you realize like what else is going on around me that I have absolutely no idea, but it was, I mean, it was really cool that how thorough everything was and, and, um, and just the thought that went into it, it was, it, it was just, it was such a, and you feel like you're in a movie. Like you watch that stuff in movies and, you know, in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, well, this, you know, that's, it's just Hollywood. And this is like, okay, wow, some of this stuff actually does happen. That was really cool to see. I mean, I remember seeing yeah. him at a podium and I think they mm-hmm. were saying like, this is where the Senate or the House meets. Yeah. I'm like, well, that's amazing. It's underground. That was really cool. Uh, you also had the opportunity to meet uh, golf royalty, right? And uh, Sam Sneed Jr. Tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about that experience. Yeah, no, I mean, everything there is, is, uh, obviously he was the pro emeritus there for a long time. Um, anything, uh, Sam Sneed in those parts is as good as gold. Um, so that, uh, that, that kind of royalty doesn't, uh, I don't get awestruck very often, but, but that name carries a lot of weight. That was, that was really neat. Was he around when you came back to play in your event after winning big break? Uh, don't think so. Although I did talk to Tom Watson that year at the Greenbrier, which was Jeez. which was really cool. Yeah, Holy big God. Watson. Fan. Yeah, more royalty. All yeah, right, let's right. get into the flop shot from three different locations. Uh, take us through your feeling. I mean, everybody says when you get there, it's you know it looks a little daunting. You're closer, and it's right in front of you. And uh, yeah. you know, tell us about your thoughts about the flop wall. It's, it's weird. And it's not, I mean, the height of the wall is not an issue. My, my flop shot ability has always been fine. It's just the fact that you can't see your target is such a weird golf is such a target driven game. I mean, that's, that's the key to anything is, you know, find a target, be specific. And when you're just staring at a, at a wall in front of you, you kind of half forget what you're trying to do. Um, I mean, I, I remember doing really well in the flop challenge and, and um, it, it's just, it's so hard for everything to want to stop because there's something right in front of you. And all I could, all I could remember telling myself is just keep club head moving, keep club head moving. It's not, you don't have to do anything different to get it over the wall. The ball will get over the wall. You just have to get over that. And and once I kind of did that, it didn't seem, uh, you know, the, the actual physics behind it, any, any of us wouldn't have any issue hitting it over that wall. But when you can't see what's on the other side, it's amazing how, how if you let it play with you, it, it'll, it'll mess you up. Three shots, then total distance, eight feet, nine inches. Yeah. And you won. That's pretty, pretty amazing right there, I got to say. I, I, I remember watching it. And, you know, at the time I, I was hitting good shots and, and 
didn't really think much of it because I got through easily. And then I remember watching the show and I was like, damn, that was actually, that was pretty good. <laughs> Absolutely. Unbelievable. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about the number three. I think it's number three with the huge swale in the middle. I'm interested in hearing about, obviously that was your first time seeing that massive mm-hmm. green and putting from it. You did a bunker shot. I think you did a couple other shots in the fairway from different distances. And then you went mm-hmm. back and didn't you have to play that? Same. When you- yeah, yeah. I, I want to say you had to hit a putt, a bunker shot, and then a full shot, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, and and they maybe added up the the footage of of your total. But yeah, the the beer it's green is is I'm I'm a big fan of golf course architecture, and and you know that's a that's a Scottish template hole, and um, you know the old white TPC has has a bunch of them. Um, and that's just one of the classic designs and man, it is just, it's such a cool, cool design feature. I mean, I remember when I played in the tournament, the tees were pretty much, you know, within a yard or two of each other, um, during the tournament. And I want to say I hit an eight iron to the front pin and a four iron to the back pin. I mean, it, it literally went from 165 yards to 215 yards or something like that without the tee box moving. That green is just insane, um, and uh, I just I think that was the first time I'd really seen anything like that actually in person, and and it was a it was a cool learning experience because a lot of the uh, the template holes that I've I've uh, I, I got to see playing the Greenbrier Golf Course, I've I've kind of uh, been able to that was kind of a spark for me in looking at how I look at golf course architecture. Interesting. You mentioned in the post uh, or end of day interview, you said every day is a clean slate. And if you're off, it can be your last. That's what you Mm -hmm. said right after that event that day. Um, Any thoughts around that? What were you thinking? If you remember, I know that was years ago, but. um, Yeah, no, I mean, it's the truth. I mean, it's every day you hit the reset button. I mean, you could go out and be an absolute stud for the first four episodes, but you go, you know, have a rough day and none of it matters. Um, and so I, I just remember being in a really good mind frame. Like I, I kind of just accepted that fact that any day could be my last. And, and it kind of took a little bit of weight off of my shoulders that, you know, I could go home at any point and that's fine. Um, and you know, I wish, I wish I could get into that kind of mindset more often because I remember just being clear headed and, you know what, I'm going to go down swinging and, you know, hopefully pull off the shots when I need to pull off the shots. But that was, like I said, that that first episode taught me a lot, trying to overthink things and outsmart contests and, you know, play conservatively. After that, I was like, you know what, it's not how we're going to do this. And uh, luckily it, it worked out. So at this point of the contest, if we look at the two finalists, yourself and James, it was a really a tale of two paths to the finals because you are hitting on all cylinders. You're mm-hmm. very, very consistent. And as I mentioned in the open, when you had to scramble, you scrambled and you were very successful at scrambling. Mm-hmm. He's going to elimination matches. He's doing yeah. all these different things and really not showing the NCAA champion form that you would expect from him. And by the way, it gets better because he certainly does when he starts up with you and you probably mm-hmm. were thinking, and I have a good quote that we'll talk about in a second, but you probably are thinking, oh, just what I need is here comes the, the guy that won the NCAAs now when we're head to head. But that was kind of interesting how you were on this path and it was like every interview in the show is, you know, all the guys, whether it's Ray or, J- or Brian or Isaac is saying, Mark's the guy to beat right now. Mark is so consistent. Mark is this. And James isn't even in the thought. And then he starts revving it up. And I'll mm-hmm. give you a little bit of, of, of my take on it. The horse game, you kind of just, we started to see, you know what, Mark's human. He is not a golf robot. He's yeah. a little bit human here. Talk a little about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, chipping is not, at least at the time, was not my strong suit. Um, and that, that really was. I mean, James, you know, we're watching a guy that, you know, has to scoop a chip shot, just destroy all of us. And we're like, Oh my gosh, this is, you know, and I think that was big for James because you got, you know, he had been out of professional golf for a couple of years. Um, 
but he's so freakishly talent. You could just watch episode by episode by episode, his game come back, his confidence come back, his, his trust and his ability come back. And, you know, their kind of mid late show, he was winning all of the, you know, I was, I was getting through the challenges, but James was winning a lot of the challenges and, um, you know, you could, you could see it. I mean, you, you really could see day by day, um, his game rounded back into form and his confidence starting to do the same. You know, it's interesting. We finally get to the final four immunity challenge. You remain free of elimination there. I think that's the time that Brian goes. And then it goes down to three with Isaac, yourself, and James. And you're not two under and everybody else is even. It's James two under, Isaac one under, and you even. And come back with an amazing birdie putt, by the way. And then that chip yeah. on the final hole just to seal it, basically. Um, mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about that three um, ball game there with, with Isaac. Uh, and boy, oh boy what, you know, the gentle giant with some touch, that guy can play golf, right? Yeah, he, uh, he shocked everybody. I mean, I remember early on in the show, everybody was like, okay, you know, uh, pick on the big guy. And he quickly showed that, you know, not only did he have the right demeanor, but he had the golf game to back it up that I might not look like a golfer, but I'll beat you down. Um, and he continuously did that. And, um, yeah, that, that, that last second to last episode with the three of us was, was really awesome because I, I was playing steady, but I had, gosh, I want to say I was hitting the right shots, but I was lipping out putts, um, lipping out putts and I, everything kind of had gone my way. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, Oh my gosh, like I've done played pretty flawless golf up until this point. Now they're starting to lip out. Um, and when that when the putt from off the front of the green went in on 17 and and I believe Isaac three putted uh for for me to go from one down to one up I was like let's go like this is this is the way this is supposed to happen now and um yeah I was I was short of that green on the last hole and two and it was wet tight bent grass and I was you know as I as I've said chipping especially at that time was not my strong suit and I just said you know what whatever happens happens and and it came off perfect and I was so nervous that I barely even remember hitting the shot I just I just remember seeing it nestle up there where I could make it and I was like I have no idea how that just happened but I, I you could probably give me 10 golf balls and I couldn't do that again right now which is, you know, just kind of luckily for me, that was how the, how, how the show was going. That was, that was amazing. I mean, it was just amazing and it was awesome to see. Uh, and that segued right into that, the final match between James and yourself. Um, you mentioned to step back for a second um, on two interviews around this point, one during the, the match and then or on the show anyway. And then finally you mentioned your dad. And mm-hmm. what a tribute to be able to come out of this thing to, uh, to win this thing uh, and honor your father. Talk to us a little bit about what that meant. Yeah, no, um, you know, dad was the one who got me into golf and came to all of my tournaments. And, um, you know, he was a good golfer himself. And, and um, you know, he was, he was tough on me. Uh, when it came to my golf game and I never really kind of understood it. And, and, um, you know, he was sick and ended up passing away. And, and, you know, I realized after going through what I went through on the show that, you know, he was the reason why I was able to stay tough. And, um, you know, when the last putt went in, it just all kind of, you know, came out and, um, it really was, you know, with all the, everything that had gone on between us and him getting sick. And, and, you know, it, I couldn't think of anything that would have made him happier. Um, so it, it really was, it was, you couldn't write a book better than, than how it ended up. You mentioned one point, I think it was right before the threesome at the end that uh, you were remembering that your father would say to you, get back on the golf course, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh harder. yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, and that would have been the first words out of his mouth after his funeral. All right, go back to the driving range. Um, you know, if he could have told me anything. So, um, 
it, it was weird. I was conflicted about it. And, and that was all that I could keep hearing him say is, you know, boo hoo, go, go hit some more range balls. So it awesome was, it was, it was really, it was really great. That's good stuff. Yeah. So let's talk about the finals. James le- just comes out throwing darts and uh, you know, it was so, I, it, it's interesting as you watch these things, we all as fans watching big break. And I've heard this from all of our listeners that, that, uh, contribute with the surveys and the questions for the quick hitters and all that. They seem to have favorites. They mentioned you and James and other shows. Um, this one, it was, you know, watching the entire series, there were, you weren't really pulling. Everybody was had a reason for them. Well, you know, here, look, James is coming back. Would have been a great story after what he did all series, you know, fighting back and forth. And then he would win a bunch of stuff. Your consistency and then a little bit of waiver – and all of a sudden, here you go. So it was such a great uh, ending to a great series. James has thrown those darts. And by the way, you do mention this at the end. You say, he's playing unbelievable, and I'm only down one stroke. And right. when, I, when you said that, I thought to myself, hmm, hmm. more to come here. He's not done yeah. yet. So tell us, just give us your feeling of that whole head-to-head match with James. Yeah. Um, you know, I got off to a good start. Um, yeah, I won, I, I won the second hole to go one up and was kind of cruising. And we were both hitting some nice shots, and neither one of us really could could get a putt to go in through four or five holes. And um, and then it was like one of us was just looking for a spark. Um, he hit it really close on five, I believe, uh, then did it again on six, then did it again on seven. And, you know, and that's how match play is. You're like – you know, you can be cruising along, feel like you're in control and you blink and all of a sudden you're two down. Um, I believe I came back and, and hit a nice shot and won the ninth hole. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, we were just battling both of us hitting good shots. Nobody make, nobody giving any holes to bogeys. Um, everybody, it was somebody holding their breath for, with a guy with a birdie putt to win the hole. And, um, and and yeah, when when James uh, birdied, I guess it was fourteen. Um, you know, I'm I'm like three down now with five to go, uh, or maybe it was thirteen that he made birdie. And I'm like, I I can't lose another hole. Or this is, I mean, if I go four down, uh, you know, if I lose the next hole, I'm four down with four to go. I got no chance to win this thing. And um, I'd hit some good shots and, and uh, just, it was like the spark that he was looking for earlier in the round that he found, I found, um, you know, on the 14th hole, um, I was able to hit a wedge shot in there tight. And um, that was, uh, uh, I made a nice par putt on the next hole. And then, um, yeah, I I just, I kind of just went into that kind of blank out mode. Like you're playing well, just whatever happens, happens. And, uh, gosh, I just hit the right shots at the right time. Um, and, you know, for, for Lep to, you know, be three up with five to go. And I want to say he played, played the last five holes one under and still lost. I mean, that's uh, – I, I still try to think back about how that was – how I even did that. Um, I, I just remember standing over the putt on the last hole with everything riding on it, thinking there's – it doesn't matter how I hit this putt. There's no way it can miss. And, uh, you know, you, that's one of those, uh, you know, nirvana moments for a golfer where the hole just looks like a, you know, a, a sewer cover and, and you can't figure out why it's, that happens sometimes and other times it, it uh, you know, it looks like a thimble, but it was just one of those times where, you know, I had a little downhill slider and, and it didn't matter what I did. There was no chance it wasn't going to go in. Greatest comeback ever, in my opinion, uh, just amazing. And if you weren't riveted, then you don't like golf and shouldn't be. You're on the wrong <laughs> channel because that was, that yeah. was really cool. And it, man, it was. I I was with watching with a couple of buddies, and we were talking about the pressure. Forget just if the two guys playing golf and there was a you know some kind of camera off site that you don't even see, but you know you're on TV. You know what the the stakes of fifty thousand dollars and and the Greenbrier exemption and and all of that stuff. I mean, to play under that and perform the way you two guys did, it's just, it's amazing that, uh, 
you know, it was just amazing. It was just amazing golf. Yeah. So tell me about, so let's talk a little bit about that win. So now you're playing, you win all the money and you win the exemption. Exemption is not till the next year. Right. 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 So now you're able to um, go home. Are there's no, once you go home and the show starts to air, are you the instant celebrity in town? Tell us a little bit about post big break. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was cool. It, you know, everybody, Savannah's a big town, but it acts like a small town. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, murmur about it and people were watching and people thought it was, uh, it was really cool. And we would have little watch parties and, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it kind of just kept snowballing the further and further I got into it. Um, and, how many times uh, were you asked, do you win this thing or uh, you can't a, tell? Lot, <laughs> a lot and evidently I have a great poker face because everybody was like, we honestly had no idea. Wow. So, uh, I was, I was proud of the way I was able to hide it. What was the, um, best part of the experience and maybe the least part of the experience? Um, and we, we, there was a, there's a restaurant in Savannah called B and D burgers that had just, opened a restaurant downtown and the guy who owns it, um, I play a lot of golf with and they, they have a projector that they project up onto this wall where you can watch football and stuff. And, um, some people, my sister wanted to have a viewing party and James had one up in Canada and, you know, people kind of assumed, Oh, well, there's a viewing party. He obviously wins. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm three down with five to go and everybody's looking around like, Oh my gosh, we came out, we came out here to this viewing party to watch him lose. Like, you know, it was just, it was the coolest experience watching everybody else's emotions go up and down throughout that final thing. And then, you know, the last putt went in and everybody went berserk. Oh, and that's it, great. It was, it was so cool. It really was. That is awesome. So mm -hmm. tell our listeners and those of you who just joined us, we are speaking with Mark Silvers, the big break champion from Greenbrier, Big Break Greenbrier, excuse me. Um, tell everybody what you're doing today. Uh, where are you from a part of the country, personal life, anything you want to share with everybody? Yeah, um, it's it's been, you know, the typical golfer story uh, since then. Had some success, had some low points. Um, you know, played in another U.S. Open and made the cut. And uh, after I won the Big Break, I ended up making it to Q School Finals um, and kept kept some status on the web.com tour for four years and won a Canadian tour event, uh, in that time and, and played really well. Um, just could never quite, uh, you know, get, get everything to line up like I did on the big break. Um, you know, played well at times, won some tournaments, but, but, um, you know, it's a tough game. Um, since then, I've, I've, I've played between Latin America and Canada the last couple of years, um, trying to get back to the what's now Corn Ferry Tour and played some good golf and some not so good golf. I'm actually, uh, you know, the, the coronavirus has been, has been tough on, on us golfers that, that don't have uh, status on the Corn Ferry Tour, the PGA Tour. Everybody's kind of looking around, trying to figure out what to do and uh, my game has, has stayed pretty pretty solid, so I decided to come down here and play a mini tour event in Orlando and see see how she feels. Awesome. But, yeah. That's pretty cool. What did the show teach you about your game before we talk about what it meant from a life lesson standpoint? What did it teach you about your game? Well, I mean, it, at, at that point, um, you know, it taught me that my game could hold up. I mean, I, I've never – I mean, obviously playing in a major is, is a lot of pressure, but I'm, I mean, if your game can hold up under that pressure, I, I, it made me believe that it could hold up under any pressure. Um, and, and I've played some good golf under, under a lot of pressure at times. And, and I could always kind of draw back on that experience as, you know, it's like, Hey, you've done this before, you know, you, you've, you've hit the shots and made the putts and with TV cameras in your face, um, you can do this again. Um, and so it was, it was big. Um, you know, I had a great year that, that year, um, playing mini tour golf and had some good years since then. So, um, you know, you never know. I can always, every now and then I'll go back and watch that last episode just to, to say, you know what, to pump you up. I can do it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Mark, thank you for your time. It's been really nice visiting with you. Great stories. Um, we wish you all the best in your career. 
And uh, for the listeners out there, we want to thank you. You were, we did these surveys and people wanted to hear from you. You were in top 10 of all the people that we even had out there. So really appreciate awesome. your time today. And uh, maybe we'll redo this again another time. That sounds great. Thanks so much for having me on and, and let me talk about this again. Always enjoy it. Great.